Uh-huh. Well, I'm Christy Milton. I'm one of the coordinators of Oakland Pledge Week. And for full disclosure, I also work full time for the Humane Society of the United States. So Paul's my boss. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will, would say, even if he wasn't my boss, that he is um, the VP of Farm Animal Protection for the most effective animal protection organization. Paul's been responsible for some incredible victories, as uh, has the rest of his team. We work on doing um, corporate outreach, working with some of the world's biggest corporations to improve the welfare of animals raised for food. And he also spearheaded the effort here in California to pass Prop 2 back in 2008, which some of you might have worked on to improve the welfare of animals raised for food here in California. So I hope that you will enjoy his talk, and I hope you'll join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thanks so much for being here, Paul. Thank you, Christy. Thanks so much to everybody for being here. It's awesome. You guys enjoying the free food so far? All right. Yay. Have we, is this your first Oakland Veg Week event, or have anybody been to other Veg Week events so far this week? First? A couple first. Anybody go see Dr. Esherick's talk earlier in the week? Hey. All right. Give, we have another Oakland Veg Week speaker in our midst, Dr. Melina Esherick. Please stand up. All right. So, Melina gave an awesome talk for those of you who uh, might have missed it, all about the, both the why and the how of eating more plants and eating fewer animals. A very practical, very useful talk about how to make behavioral change easier. I wish I would have gone to it because I was telling her I like to think that I'm capable of changing all my behaviors, but unfortunately, as she described it to me, that's not true. <laughs> But I'm very psyched that she's here. I wish I would have been here earlier in the week so I could have seen her talk. But I'm very psyched that Melina is here. You should go ask her lots of questions and talk to her afterwards. We should give a huge round of applause to my longtime friend, longtime coworker, and somebody who I admire so much for the great work that she's done, not only to help animals for her full-time job, but also in her work in conceiving of and doing the lion's share of work for Oakland Veg Week, Christy Middleton. <laughs> Oakland Veg Week would not exist if it were not for her. You guys have a great debt of gratitude that you owe to her. All the free food you're eating right now, you wouldn't be eating it if it weren't for her. Anyway, speaking of great people, speaking of people who have done amazing things with their lives, Christy's not the only one who has done great things. Somebody like um, the numerous people who are like you. People who are interested in protecting the planet. People who are interested in protecting animals. People who are interested here on just a few days after Earth Day who are thinking, what can I do to help the Earth? You are not the only one thinking about these issues. Bill Gates is thinking about these issues. And he's done a few impressive things in his life, too. Recently, Mr. Gates put up a new website, looking not at Microsoft, not at the Gates Foundation, but looking at the global demand for meat. This is Bill Gates' Facebook page. And what did the Microsoft tycoon have to say? By 2030, the world will need millions of tons more meat than it does today. But meeting that demand with animal products isn't sustainable. Bill Gates, one of the wealthiest billionaires in the world, talking about how it's just not sustainable to be meeting our demand for protein with so many animal products. Why? Why would it not be sustainable? You know, we hear all, we hear all the messaging during Earth Day to recycle. We hear the messaging to use less packaging. We hear the messaging to walk rather than drive or to bike or to take BART. We hear the messaging of putting our of putting our energy efficient light bulbs in. But how many times do we hear, eat less meat? How many times do we hear it? Not enough. And we should be hearing it more. Because you know why? Animal agriculture is the number one cause of climate change in the world. Animal agriculture is producing more greenhouse gas emissions than any other category. And it's just not sustainable to be eating so much meat. Bill Gates is talking about the future of food on his website, The Gates Notes. And he talks about how we need to reinvent our protein sources, to move away from a diet that's based so heavily on meat, eggs, and dairy, and instead move to one that is based more on 
plants. What else does Mr. Gates have to say? I'll let him tell you in this short video that Gates produced. We all need protein. Most of us get it from meat. But animals aren't the most efficient way to get it. Producing one kilogram of beef requires 150 square meters of land and 15,000 liters of water, most of which is used to grow feed for the animal. And producing that same kilogram of beef generates 27 kilograms of CO2. That's the equivalent of driving your car more than 100 miles. Tasty? Yes. Sustainable? No. But through years of research and testing, food scientists have perfected the process for turning plants into foods that deliver the same taste, texture, and protein of meat. These plant-based proteins are better for the environment. Producing them requires less land, uses less water, and produces far less CO2. And it's faster. Going from veggie fiber, grains, oils, and spices to veggie chicken takes about 30 seconds. The most exciting part? So far, we've only explored about 8% of the world's plant proteins as potential meat alternatives. And in a world where we all need protein, remaking meat is one sector of the food industry that is ripe for innovation and growth. So we, here we have one of the wealthiest people on the face of the planet producing these videos about the need to reinvent our protein sources, the need to move away, as I said, from animals and moving into the plant-based sector. And he's putting his money where his mouth is. He's investing in plant-based protein companies that are helping to change the future of food for us and for people all around the world. So, why does the Humane Society of the United States care about this, right? I mean, a lot of the times people think about the Humane Society, what do they think of? Dogs, cats, maybe wildlife. And true, that's the lion's share of what we do, or really the dog and cat share, if you will. Some people may think about the temporary shelters that we set up in the wake of disasters, or they think about the rescue work we do in the midst of disasters. They may think about the criminal gangs of cockfighters and dogfighters we're rounding up and putting in jail. Or they might think about our free veterinary services that we provide, free spay and neuter, and other services for impoverished communities. But the Humane Society is interested in the welfare of all animals. Not just dogs, cats, and wildlife, but all animals including farm animals. And here, the, the connection between wildlife and farm animals has never been clearer than on any other issue. Because what's good for wildlife, that we mitigate climate change, that we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, is what's good for farm animals. Frankly, that we eat fewer of them. So, when we think about farm animal protection, the HSUS's interest in this is quite simple. In short, farm animals, like the dogs and the cats who we welcome into our homes and into our families, are individuals. They have likes, they have dislikes, they have personalities, and most importantly, they want to avoid suffering. Yet too often on our nation's factory farms and in our slaughter plants, we cause them suffering that is so horrible that if the perpetrators were inflicting these cruelties on dogs or cats, they'd probably be thrown in jail. But because the victims aren't dogs or cats, because they're chickens or turkeys or pigs, we excuse it. We exempt it from the cruelty codes, and we allow standard industry practices that are, simply put, cruel and inhumane. And it's not just that we're treating them so cruelly. It's the numbers in which we are treating them so cruelly as well. If you were to take every other category of animal exploitation, using animals for experimentation, using animals for their fur, using animals in circuses, animals who are killed by hunters, every other form of animal usage in our society, and you compared it to the number of farm animals who we are using and killing for food, it's dwarfed. It's not even, more than nine out of 10 animals who are killing are farm animals. And that's not to suggest that we shouldn't be concerned about the treatment of dogs or cats or wildlife, far from it. They deserve more protection, not less. But it is to suggest that if we're serious about wanting to fundamentally reduce the universe of animal suffering that we as a species are causing, we have to be more concerned than we've been in the past about the treatment of farm animals. Now, thinking about 9 or 10 billion animals being killed for food, it's just too astronomical. Our brains can't contemplate that, what, that number. It's just too high. It's not in our experience to understand what it means. So to put it on a second-by-second -second basis, 
you can see essentially how many seconds, how many animals per second, rather, we're slaughtering. Every single second in the United States around the clock. It's just so immense that it basically defies comprehension. This is like actual time. Actual time. So in the, uh, you know, I don't plan to speak for more than about three hours tonight. So when we think about that, <laughs> that's going to be over 3 million animals. I mean, it's about, about a little bit more than 24 million animals every day who are being slaughtered uh, for food alone. And perhaps if they were all treated like this, the severity of the problem wouldn't be so severe, right? If they were all treated like this, you think, well, you know, at least they had decent lives. But they're not. Nearly every single one of them is treated instead like this. 99% of farm animals never step foot on a blade of grass. They never have the sun on their back. You look at that tiny little sliver of animals who are actually out on pasture, this is bigger than what it is. I actually made this a little bit bigger just in order to make it perceptible. That's how severe the problem is. But isn't that the real problem? Isn't that the problem? We'll get to that during Q&A. So when you have 99 plus percent of animals living on barren concrete, you know that you have some real problems. So in short, this is the type of system of animal agriculture that we now have. Animals aren't out on pasture. This isn't an isolated incident of animal cruelty. We're talking not about a few rotten eggs in an industry. We're talking about standard industry practices that are so extreme that are so inhumane that they are just out of step with mainstream American values about how animals ought to be treated, such that in the pork industry, millions of pigs are locked inside of cages so small they can't even turn around. They aren't temporary holding kennels. This is 24-7 permanently for their, basically, nearly their entire lives are spent in two-foot-wide metal cages. You have egg-laying hens who are locked inside of barren battery cages so cramped that each bird has less space than a single sheet of paper on which to live for more than a year before she's slaughtered. They can't even spread their wings. It's difficult to imagine a more miserable existence than that of the hundreds of millions of laying hens. You go to the supermarket, more than nine out of 10 egg cartons that you'll find come from birds who lived just like this. We take ducks and geese and we force feed them to produce foie gras, a diseased liver in their bodies that we then market as a delicacy. We take chickens who we raise for meat and we breed them to grow so bulky so fast that many of them have difficulty even taking more than a few pitiful steps before they collapse underneath their own bulk by the end of their abbreviated six week lives. We take calves and we take them away from their mothers and chain them by the neck inside of veal crates where they can't turn around for four months prior to slaughter. We take cows and cut their tails off with no pain relief whatsoever. Imagine if we were to do any of these to dogs or cats. Imagine. Anybody have a male dog? Anybody have a male dog? Michelle, what's your dog's name? Chance. Chance, okay. So let's say, you know, Michelle I know is a very responsible animal advocate and so Chance, I'm sure, is already neutered because Michelle is concerned about overpopulation of dogs and the fact that we have uh, more dogs than we have homes. So um, let's just say Michelle adopted Chance and she's like, I'm going to get Chance neutered because I want to do the right thing. And you brought Chance to the vet. And the vet said, OK, Michelle, I'll neuter him, no problem. And then he takes out a scalpel and just starts going to town, right? Cuts Chance's testicles off with no painkiller. What do you think would happen to your vet? <laughs> fired, sued, and killed. All right. <laughs> uh, fired, sued, maybe charged with criminal animal cruelty, perhaps put in jail, maybe lose his license. But what if it wasn't Michelle? And what if it wasn't Chance? But what if instead it was not a vet, but an untrained farmhand who has no animal care experience whatsoever, and instead of Chance, it's a pig or a calf? The same exact procedure done in the same exact way but when the victim isn't a dog, but instead is a pig or a calf who feel pain with every bit as much of intensity as a dog or cat would, it's excused because it's exempted from most state anti-cruelty codes. Things that would get you sent to prison by doing to a dog, you can do with impunity, for the most part, to farm animals. That's how bad this problem is. My view is that 
we need to change this. And I know that you're probably here because you feel the same. We need to alter the course of history, just as Gandhi said, that a small body of determined spirits fired by an unquenchable faith in their mission can alter the course of history. And that's the goal. That's the goal of all of us who are involved in this great social justice struggle, to expand our circle of moral concern to include not just those who are like us, who are of our gender or our nationality or ethnicity or religion or race, but rather all of us who are capable of feeling pain deserve to have our interests considered, and especially our interest in avoiding pain. That's what our movement really is about. So when we think about how we do that, there's a number of ways. The first is that we start getting legal protection from these abuses that we've been talking about for farm animals. It's not a speedy road, but it's one that we must travel on. 11 years ago, there wasn't a single state that had banned any standard factory farming practice whatsoever. Not one. You could do virtually anything that you wanted. It's a barren landscape when it came to farm animal protection laws at the state level. Fast forward to today and we have some promising growth. Not the lush rainforest that we all want, but we have now nine states that have banned various inhumane factory farming practices from force feeding for foie gras, battery cages for laying hens, veal crates for calves, gestation crates for pigs, tail docking of dairy cows, and so on. And so we're making some progress. We hope very soon that, excuse me, that New Jersey will be the next state to ban gestation crates. We've passed a bill through both the Senate and the House there. And after May 13th, that bill will be going to Governor Chris Christie, where we hope he will sign it and make that the 10th state to ban gestation crates. Time will tell. But let us not forget that this is what the meat industry wants. This is exactly what they want, to keep people in the dark. The meat industry wants Americans to be completely unfamiliar with these routine abuses. You guys know what gestation crates and battery cages are, but you walk out on the street, most people out there have never heard of them, and that's just the way they want it. The greatest threat to the meat industry's status quo is people becoming more familiar with what it is actually doing to animals. The greatest tool we have in our toolkit to changing, to altering the course of history, to changing the status of these animals is simply by informing people of what types of abuses they're so routinely being subjected to. In other words, we need to shine a bright light on this very dark and hidden world of animal cruelty that animals too often endure in our nation's meat industry. And we do that through conducting undercover investigations. HSUS and other great groups like Mercy for Animals and Compassion Over Killing send undercover investigators to factory farms and to slaughter plants to livestock auctions and more using hidden cameras. Here is a scene, an iconic image from HSUS's 2008 investigation at a California dairy cow slaughter plant where downed cows, animals who are too sick or injured even to stand and walk to their own slaughter, were being moved around with forklifts. They were being dragged by chains, they were being electrically prodded, they were being kicked and beaten, in some cases even being waterboarded, having high pressure uh, hoses being shoved up their nostrils to try to force them to stand and escape their tormentors. This case led to the largest meat recall in U.S. history, cruelty convictions, slaughter plant shutdown, congressional hearings, as well as a new federal policy banning the slaughter of adult downer cattle. Fast forward another year, we did another investigation at this time at a dairy calf slaughter plant where they were skinning animals alive, downed calves who couldn't stand and walk to their own slaughter. This led to a new federal policy banning the slaughter of downer calves. Fast forward again, and just two weeks ago, we saw in Wyoming, after an HSUS investigation into a pig, a, a pig factory that was supplying pigs to Tyson Foods, several people pleading guilty to criminal animal cruelty. These people not only were confining pigs in crates where they couldn't even turn around for their whole lives, they were ruthlessly beating them, taking pigs and bowling them like bowling balls down alleyways, beating them. In one case, a 500-pound sow had a broken leg and couldn't stand, and a worker jumped up and down on top of her broken leg to try to get her to get up. This is the type of thing that when you send somebody with a hidden camera in to see what's really happening behind the walls of the factory farming industry, what we're routinely coming out with time and time again. And what's the meat industry's response to these whistleblowing exposés that are leading to criminal convictions, that are leading to meat recalls and slaughter plant shutdowns and more? It it's not to try to prevent the abuses from taking place. 
Rather, it's simply to prevent Americans from finding out about those abuses in the first place. Their goal is not to encourage whistleblowers. Their goal is to blow the whistle on the whistleblower. And you can see here, just um, on April 7th, just a few weeks ago, the Sunday New York Times, A1 of the Sunday New York Times, videos show cruelty on the farm and taping becomes the crime. Taping becomes the crime. The meat industry's response to our exposés is to try to make it a crime simply to take a photo or a video of animal abuse on factory farms. In fact, they passed this law in Utah last year that now if you want to go to a slaughter plant in Utah and just take a photo, that's a crime. That's a crime. They're trying to pass similar laws throughout the nation to protect this industry from the nefarious threat of whistleblowers with cameras. You know that you have a lot to hide when you want to make it a crime for somebody to take a photo of what you're doing. That is a real problem and that is what we ought to be thinking about when we sit down to eat. Is this the kind of industry that I want to be supporting every time I sit down to eat? We need to think about whether it's the type of industry we want to support, not just because they want to keep us in the dark, not just because they're abusing animals, as horrible as both of those are, but as I talked about earlier and as you saw in the Bill Gates video earlier, this is an industry that is a major culprit in climate change. So much so that when you start looking at what the experts about climate change are saying, not necessarily what we hear in all of the mainstream press here in the U.S., when you start looking at what the worldwide experts are saying, it becomes pretty clear. For example, in the Telegraph, eat less meat to save the planet, researchers warn, noting that scientists are warning Westerners need to cut half the meat out of their diet to prevent global warming. Half the meat. In The Guardian, the UN is telling people, eat less meat to curb global warming, saying give up meat for one day a week initially and then decrease it from there. We're seeing the UN's World Water Day. This is a day intending to encourage us to conserve water. And when they say conserve water, they don't mean drink less water. They're not talking about, oh, make sure you turn the faucet off while you're brushing your teeth. Of course you should do that, needless to say. But most water is not consumed by us directly. Most water isn't coming out of your tap. It's not going into your mouth. Most water is being used to produce the food that we eat. And the vast majority of that water is being used to produce animal products. Because huge quantities of corn, of soy, and other uh, crops are being used to feed farm animals. And we would be using far fewer crops if we ate the crops directly rather than funneling it through these inefficient converters of plant matter into protein. So what does the UN say the number one thing to do to observe World Water Day? Replace meat, replace meat with another source of protein. The number one thing that you can do. And interestingly, when you start looking at what the academic literature on this says about it, you look at these studies like a global assessment of the water footprint of farm animal products. And interestingly, you know what you find? The researchers are saying the same thing. Managing the demands for animal products by promoting a dietary shift away from a meat-rich diet will be an inevitable component in the environmental policy of governments. An inevitable component. That's how important we're seeing this issue becoming. It's no longer the case that we can think about climate change just as something like putting in the efficient light bulb or taking BART instead of driving. We need to start thinking about climate change in terms of what we put on our plates. So, oops, sorry, I'm going backwards here. Anyway, the point is that what's bad for farm animals is also bad for the planet, and it's bad for us. The diet that we are so accustomed to eating in this country, a diet that is so centered around meat, eggs, and dairy, is increasing our own risk of diseases of affluence heart disease, various cancers, type 2 diabetes, and more. It's causing enormous cruelty to animals that few people would ever even want to bear witness to, let alone would want to participate in causing themselves. And it is heating our planet to unsustainably hot levels that threaten, literally, our civilization. It's not a joking matter. That is what climate change actually threatens for us. The good news is that things are starting to turn around. If you look at The Economist, here's what they called us, the kings of the carnivores, all right? 
United States perch nearly atop the world when it comes to per capita consumption of animals. I mean, it's unbelievable to me how many times I talk to people who, generally speaking, don't go one meal of their day without eating an animal product. Not one. That they have meat, eggs, or dairy at some, at some level in every single meal. So much so that you, know, I, you, know, you talk to people and, and you, you know, talk with them about whether they've ever eaten a vegan meal in their life. And they're starting to think, I don't know. Have I ever had one meal without animals being sacrificed for it? I don't know. And so anyway, the point is, you look at this. And you see, though, that it's a 2007 chart from The Economist. Fast forward five years or so to today, and we're seeing Americans are eating a lot more plants, and we're eating a lot fewer animals. Interestingly, here's how it breaks down. So you look at 1984 to the present. Forget about 1984. Look all the way back to 1950, right? After World War II, American consumption of animal products just went like this. Nearly every single year, consumption increased and increased and increased and increased. So much so that starting around, just for ease, I started at 84 here. You see this is going up and up and up until 2007, at which point meat consumption began falling off of a cliff. A 12.2% decline in meat consumption in the United States per capita from 2007 to 2012, with USDA projecting that it will continue declining after, even beyond 2012. So much so that you look at our charts of animal slaughter. These are USDA statistics. And you can see around 1950, we're slaughtering around 100 million animals per year. And then all the way up to 2007, 9.5 billion animals per year. And then what happened in 2007? Despite increasing human population, more and more Americans, the, de the per capita decline was so great that we're now down to 9.0 billion per year. Half a billion animals spared the miseries of factory farming because Americans started changing our diets. Half a billion animals. Think about how vast that number is. Yes, 9 billion is still extraordinarily high, but half a billion animals is more than all the animals we use in experimentation, all the animals killed by hunters, all the animals used in circuses, by the fur industry, all of that combined is less than half a billion. This is one of the greatest successes that has ever come about for animal welfare in the history of the animal welfare movement. Half a billion fewer animals being slaughtered for food. Why? Well, yes, we know that increasing feed prices due to increased demand for ethanol are increasing prices, and that has partly to do with it. But we can also look and see what the CME group, the folks who own the Dow Jones uh, Index, have to say about it, and they say, that when you add in the efforts of a large number of NGOs that oppose meat consumption for reasons ranging from environment to animal rights to social justice, one would conclude that it was amazing that consumption held up as long as it did. Here you have one of the most important economic analysts in the country crediting the environmental and animal welfare communities with part of this decline in meat consumption here in the United States. And it's not just in the hard data that we see this. We see it in the trade journal press. You read Nation's Restaurant News, the main trade publication for the restaurant industry. I'm sure you guys all subscribe. <laughs> Veggie heavy brands see growth in sales and popularity. Look at Euromonitor International across the Atlantic. The war on meat, how low meat and no meat diets are impacting consumer markets, noting Western consumers are cutting back on their meat consumption. Nation's Restaurant News had another issue in which they looked at the top 50 things changing the game in the restaurant industry at number seven, clocking in. Meet free menus, and each one of us can help fuel this progress. Each one of us can help, even if we never knew that we had it in us, can be a hero for the planet and a hero for animals. We can move from an inhumane diet to one that is a little bit more humane. How do we do it? Well, you have here not only a plethora of beautiful smorgasbord of great plant-based food options for you to try. But you also have a great guide from the Humane Society of the United States, the HSUS Guide to Meat-Free Eating. You can take it. It has great free recipes. Take one for your friend. Bring it to your friends at work tomorrow and tell them it would mean a lot to you if they would read it. But let's say you don't want to use HSUS's guide. You're like, ah, I'm not so interested in getting an animal, protections person, an animal protection group's guide. Maybe instead you might prefer to use Oprah Winfrey's vegan starter kit, right? The fact is that we've gone from, I became a vegan in 1993. 
All right, people didn't know what the word meant, let alone how to pronounce it. All right, today some of the most well-known figures in the world, like Oprah, now have their own vegan starter kits. Some of you are like, "Oh, that's weak, Oprah. She's not even on TV anymore, right?" <laughs> uh, who's the number one daily talk, uh, daytime talk show host now? Ellen. Oh, Ellen. Oh, that's really fascinating because Ellen happens to have her own vegan starter kit. Now you can go to Warner Brothers' website, Going Vegan with Ellen. Culture. <laughs> Cultural icons, thank you. Cultural icons are touting the benefits of plant-based eating like never before. Things that would have been considered impossible a decade ago are now happening on a matter, really, almost a daily basis. Even environmental groups are getting on board with this message. Environmental Defense Fund noting that if every American just skipped one meal of chicken per week and substituted vegetables, not even a meatless Monday, just one meal, one twenty-first reduction, that it would be the equivalent of taking half a million cars off of U.S. roads. Half a million cars if we get every American just to do one vegetarian meal per week. It's both extraordinarily optimistic and pathetic at the same time to think about how minimal something is, but what a great effect it could actually have. Sierra Club is urging people to eat less meat as their New Year's resolutions. We're seeing even Al Gore who did MIC Inconvenient Truth, all right? You watch Inconvenient Truth, you're like, man, when is he going to get to it? I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I okay, can't wait till he's going to get to it. He's going to talk about meat eating, and then he goes to his family's cattle ranch, like, all right, here it is, I'm going to get it. And then it never comes up. But even Al Gore, saying he's cut back sharply on the meat that he eats. If that makes you nostalgic for the Clinton administration, perhaps, then think about what Mr. President himself, the king of politics, has to say on the matter. I went on essentially a plant-based diet. Eighty-two percent of the people who have done that, their arterial blockage cleans up, and I've lost 24 pounds. I didn't ever dream this would happen. So now we've got Oprah, we've got Ellen, you've got Bill Gates, you've got Bill Clinton, all talking about the benefits of eating a plant-based diet. The environmental groups are touting the benefits of it. Who else could possibly be talking about this? Well, if we have the king of politics, what about the king of the ring? My man, Mike Tyson, a man who is better known for eating a human ear than for eating an ear of corn, saying it's an awesome feeling. He's been <coughs> vegan for a couple of years and he feels great. You know when you got Mike Tyson on your side, your movement is going places. Reverend Al Sharpton talking about how, how he regained his own personal health by becoming a vegetarian, saying, I overhauled my diet. First, I gave up red meat, then chicken. I also kept in mind the words of another vegetarian friend, Coretta Scott King, the wife of Martin Luther King Jr., who always spoke of the ethical reasons to give up meat. Oxfam, the renowned international aid organization, talking about the need to reduce meat consumption for environmental reasons, noting the reality is that it takes massive amounts of land, water, fertilizer, oil, and other resources to produce meat, significantly more than it requires to grow other nutritious and delicious kinds of food. This is the world that we are now living in, where the term vegan and vegetarian used to be a fringe concept. It used to be out of the mainstream, yet today it's so firmly cemented in the mainstream that again our cultural icons are touting the benefits of it and we're seeing the difference in per capita rates of meat consumption coming down, the number of animals who are being raised and killed for food coming down. It's all progress. This is part of the winning side. We're seeing, excuse me, we're seeing that for the first time really Animal advocates and environmentalists have been right about this factory farming issue for so long, but now we're finding ourselves not just on the right side, we're finding ourselves on the winning side, and the writing is on the wall. It's so clear, looking into the future, what the trajectory is going to be. If you look at three Sundays ago, the New York Times Sunday Magazine, Mark Bittman talking about big veg, yes, health food, fast food is possible. Even on the cover of Time Magazine, Dr. Oz saying, what to eat now, focus squarely, or really rectangularly, on all plants, saying what to eat now. That leads us to some of the more institutional changes. Yes, each one of us can help reduce our own consumption, but perhaps even more important are the institutional changes that are taking place. Now, Meatless Monday is not a concept that was invented by a group like the Humane Society of the US. In fact, anybody know who did come up with the original concept for Meatless Monday? <laughs> 
Paul McCartney, Alex Hershaft, Christy raises her hand. I know that she knows that. I'm not going to call her. Yeah. Oh, that, we're going to get to them, the learners, but we'll get to them. You all are wrong. <laughs> and um, Meatless Monday was actually invented by the U.S. government during World War I as a resource-saving measure to aid the wartime effort. Because meat, meat production is so inefficient that when you're in wartime and you want to free up resources for your troops, you don't want to be squandering your resources on inefficient food production at home. And so the U.S. government urged Americans to support the war effort by engaging in a meatless Monday. The idea after World War I went away, but guess who resurrected it during World War II? Same thing, to again introduce a meatless Monday into the country to try to help the wartime effort. And that went away. And then your nice Jewish couple in New York, the learners, reinvented it along with the help of the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in 2003, again as a wartime effort, but not a war in a European theater. This time a war on climate change, a war on obesity, on type 2 diabetes, on animal cruelty. This is what Meatless Monday has now been repurposed for to try to declare war on these grave societal ills that are plaguing us as a society. In Pleasanton, all after working with Christy Middleton, their schools are now doing all meatless Mondays, so much so that it even made the news. You can see what happened when Pleasanton started its school district's meatless Monday campaign. It's not just Pleasanton, though. Christie has worked with the Detroit public school system to implement Meatless Mondays. She's worked with Broward County to implement Meatless Mondays. We're seeing even in LA, Christie worked with the second largest school district in the United States, serving 650,000 meals every single day, every single day, K through 12, and they're now entirely vegetarian every day single Monday. 34 million fewer meals of meat served every year because of the work that was done to get LA doing Meatless Monday. Give a round of applause for that. <laughs> this type of institutional change is having a tangible reduction in meat demand. It's having a tangible influence on the students who go to school and see vegetarian meals being offered to them. They see the marketing, whether it's HSUS's posters or the, or the learners' posters as well, um, who are now directly going uh, to help influence them to make better, saner, more humane, more environmentally friendly choices. When we talk about institutional change, we're talking not just about institutional change in the school systems or in hospitals, but we're also talking about um, moving our markets in the right direction, a direction away from animals and a direction toward plants. And so it's also looking at helping move the markets on an individual basis, right? The Florida Department of Health, after Broward County started doing its Meatless Monday program, they then put out uh, their own advertising campaign. The Florida Department of Health. Here are their billboards that they're having, they have up in Florida right now. Go meatless on Monday. Good for you. Good for the planet. And my favorite, my favorite Meatless Monday promo ever, by far, are the radio ads that they're doing throughout Florida from the Florida Department of Health. You couldn't make this up. So I'm going to play it for you, and you can listen to what the Department of Health's Meatless Monday ads sound like. They're so spectacular, I could never get enough of listening to it. Did you find everything today, ma'am? Almost. I think you're in black beans. We should have more in tomorrow. Seems like we sold a lot of them lately. I guess everyone is trying Meatless Mondays. Meatless Mondays? You know, Meatless Mondays. It's a new idea the health department is promoting. I, I don't get it. Replacing some of the meat in your diet with other healthy proteins can help you control your weight and reduce your risk for certain diseases. Producing vegetable proteins uses less water and energy, so it's good for the planet, too. Monday is a great day for a fresh start, so it's easy to remember. Huh, I like this idea. 
Meatless Mondays. Good for you. Good for the planet. Join the global movement to celebrate Meatless Mondays. Find weekly recipes and more information about meatless meals at EscambiaHealth.com. The Florida Department of Health has... So, anyway... You know, this is the new future that we're facing, where governments and school districts and hospitals are getting on board with this message. It's truly incredible to see the progress that our movement is making. Major food service companies like Sodexo are putting point-of-purchase materials in their cafeterias. Have a healthy Monday. Go meatless. Compass Group, the largest food service company in the entire world, putting these type of of point-of-purchase materials in their cafeterias. Be a flexitarian, it's simple, once a week, skip meat. Even Burger King, the Burger King, is talking about Meatless Mondays. I'm sure you all are fans of theirs on Facebook, so you probably already saw this post. But let me just remind you, Burger King, want to go meatless this Monday? We can help. Try and stop in and try our BK Veggie Burger from Morning Star Farms. Truly incredible. You know that you're winning when Burger King starts promoting Meatless Monday. Consumer Affairs talking about our hamburgers dying a slow death. This is just from about 10 days ago, talking about how more and more people are switching to veggie burgers as opposed to meat-based burgers. And this is where it gets really interesting, because the fact of the matter is that we're seeing all of this progress, but it's not necessarily because people are becoming vegetarian or vegan. In fact, if you look at the rate of vegetarians and vegans in the country, it's about 5% of people are vegetarian or vegan, which is pretty much the same that it's been for a couple decades now. The real change that we're seeing are these people who are eating vegetarian at more than half their meals. You can see here 16%. 16% of Americans report that they eat vegetarian more than half the time. That's basically like saying 8% of people are vegetarian, just from from the meat industry's perspective in terms of supply and demand. And that means that there's more reduction in demand for meat from all these so-called flexitarians than there is from all the vegetarians and vegans combined. We're seeing massive changes from these people who are meat reducers. It's so amazing to see. So how do they do it? Well, it's pretty simple. Imagine that you were a smoker and you wanted to quit smoking. Most likely, you're not going to go cold turkey. Most likely, what you're going to do is use something like this. You're going to use something that's going to help you wean yourself off of your addiction. Most Americans have been eating meat daily for their entire lives, for decades. It's not something that you can just easily change overnight. So, presume that you enjoy the taste, let's say, of chicken. Instead of eating an actual chicken, why not try a Gardein chicken product? It's all natural, made from soy and pea protein. It's delicious. Try it out. And you can enjoy the same taste and texture of a food that you've enjoyed your entire life without all of the associated animal cruelty and environmental problems that are associated with that product. Instead of eating Tyson chicken nuggets, you can try out Morningstar Farms chicken nuggets. Or you can try any one of Gardein's products from their buffalo wings, crispy tenders, beef lift tips, beef lift tips and more. Check them out. They are really good. They're worth your while. If you don't want to eat a hamburger, you can try a Boca burger. If you want to avoid a hot dog, you can try an Eve's veggie dog. They taste just like hot dogs, but surprisingly, they are much better for you. They're much better for the planet. And of course, they're much better for the pigs. Or you can do something crazy. You can do something radical. You can do something that is foreign to most Americans and is definitely something that many people will shirk at the idea of but I'm putting it out there because I want to do you a favor. You could try eating actual vegetables, <laughs> all right? It's a radical notion, but they taste great, they're good for you, and they will reduce your risk of the various diseases that we've been talking about tonight. You can try them in ethnic foods, you can try them in a bean and rice burrito, you can try them in chili. If you think that chili needs meat, then you don't know beans. What you can try them out on is any of these other recipes we've been talking about earlier. And this is why Time Magazine is talking about both the meatless and the less meat revolution. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It doesn't have to be black or white. I had somebody just two days ago tell me uh, that she could never be vegetarian because she couldn't miss her own mother's Thanksgiving turkey. I said, great, try to be a vegetarian except on Thanksgiving and eat your mother's turkey then. It's not all or nothing. This is not a game where we're trying to play some purity game. It's not a strict orthodoxy. People are all on different points in a spectrum. 
And each one of us should do what we think was within our own reasonable chances of doing better in the world. We should congratulate ourselves for the positive steps that we're taking rather than self-flagellating over things that we haven't yet done. None of us are perfect and none of us are going to be perfect, but we can always strive to do better. We have come such a long way in our movement, such a long way from the days when people didn't know what a vegan was, such a long way from the days when the greatest uh, messengers for the climate change uh, debate weren't even talking about animal agriculture, till the day now where we have our cultural icons all talking about the need to reduce meat consumption and more. But we still have an extraordinarily long way to go. As I said, there's still 9 billion animals we're raising and killing for food. Even with that 12.2% decline in meat consumption, we're still perched nearly atop the world when it comes to per capita rates of meat consumption. We have, a, oops, excuse me. Uh, we have such a long way to go, but I take solace in so much of what I see happening. I take solace in all the good progress that we've been talking about tonight, and I take solace especially in looking at the way that market-based solutions are going to help improve the world. You look at what Bill Gates was talking about in the video that we earlier saw about these plant-based protein companies, right? And I want to highlight one of them, because in the video we saw earlier, Gates was just talking about the need to reduce meat consumption. But this is an actual example of a company that is doing great things in the world that give me hope that we are going to go much further than we've gone in the past. One third of all the eggs that are produced in this country are used for liquid purposes. That means that these eggs are not being sold in cartons in the supermarket. They're being eaten in cookies, in cakes, in brownies, in pastas, in mayonnaise, in other products where people don't even know they're getting eggs. They don't even know they're eating it. They get a cookie, people don't even think I'm getting eggs. But what if you could create a completely all natural plant-based egg replacer that was functionally equivalent to eggs but was cheaper than eggs. That a major manufacturer, an industrial user of eggs could switch to, nobody would ever know the difference, except it would be cheaper for them to do it. Think about how that would change the world. And then we can think about this company, Hampton Creek Foods, based here in San Francisco, whose CEO is standing up in the back, Joshua Tetrick, give him a round of applause. And you can see Bill, and you can see Bill Gates's video about Josh. One of the big reasons why we decided to buy eggs is the sheer magnitude of what we're talking about. 1.1 trillion eggs were laid last year around the world. The vast majority of eggs, approximately 99%, come from these places called battery cage facilities. Imagine an industrial warehouse, dim the lights, stack row upon row upon row of cages on top of each other, and put 7 to 10 female chickens inside each cage, a cage is about the size of a conventional oven, and just leave them there for two years. And these chickens are fed massive amounts of soy and massive amounts of corn, which require massive amounts of fertilizer, which require massive amounts of oil. So we see a system like that, and we say, this is just absurd. The biggest advantage that we have is we see a system, a system that is broken. And instead of trying to incrementally improve upon that system, we want to create a whole new model that makes the current system obsolete. And the whole new model is based around something that has been around for hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, the plant. So how do you take a variety of plant-based components out there in the world, bring them together, and replicate this miracle of nature called the egg? This is the type of project that gives me hope that the progress that we have seen so far is not going to stagnate. In fact, it's only going to continue, and it's going to increase in its pace because very smart people like Josh Tetrick are starting their own companies to help replace the current model of protein production that we have today with something that's far more sustainable, far better for our health, far better for animals, far better for the planet. And that, I think, is what's going to bring us into the future. I think about what Matthew Scully, the author of a great book called Dominion, if you've not read it, I highly encourage you to read it, said about this issue. He said... How we treat our fellow creatures is only one more way in which each of us every day writes our own epitaph, bearing into the world a message of light and life or just more darkness and death. 
adding to its joy or adding to its despair. And for me, that's what being a part of this animal advocacy community is all about. It's about bearing into the, mess, into the world a message of more light and life. It's about trying to build a more humane society. It's about taking the side of the vulnerable against the cruelty of the powerful. It's about giving a voice to these voiceless animals who are suffering silently, languishing on factory farms with nobody to advocate for them but us. I don't have any doubt that we are going to reach a day when our relationship with other animals is going to be based no longer on violence and domination, but rather upon compassion and respect, and that people then will look back on what we are currently doing today and how damaging it was to them and to us at the same exact time. And they're going to look back in utter revulsion at the ways in which we so selfishly and so commonly trashed these animals and our planet. And they're going to look back with revulsion and wonder, how could anyone have, done, have allowed that? How could anyone have sat idly by while these horrible atrocities were occurring that were so bad for every living inhabitant of the planet? And part of being a part of the animal community for me is of being able to say, you know what? I was there, that I didn't sit idly by on the sidelines, that I got in there and tried to give a voice to those animals. And yes, I know that it can seem so hard. I know it can seem impossible to envision a day like that when we no longer view animals just as mere commodities to be exploited for whatever whim we, we, we may have. But I take solace in thinking about someone else who, always, who said that it always seems impossible until it's done. To think that a man who spent 27 years in prison became the president of his nation seemed impossible. It would have seemed impossible in 1900 that women were going to get the right to vote, yet two decades later, they did. It would have seemed impossible in the 1850s that slavery would be ended in our society within this people's lifetime. In fact, the Chicago Tribune in 1859 editorialized that no living person would see an end to slavery in their lifetime. In 1859, it would have seemed impossible in 1950 that blacks and whites would soon be using the same public restrooms and public swimming pools and public water fountains. It would have seemed impossible just 20 years ago that we would have a black president. It would have seemed impossible, I think, even five years ago to think that so many of, that really a majority of the U.S. Senate now supports gay marriage and that you couldn't even get nominated in the Democratic Party without supporting it now. For president. That would have seemed impossible. And yet all of this has happened. When I was watching the DNC convention and I saw all these tens of thousands of people down there in North Carolina cheering for a black president and tens of thousands of people cheering for gay rights and I thought to myself I could almost hear it. I could almost hear them cheering for animal protection. It was so close. It seemed so close to me that the circle of moral concern as it continues expanding out so that people start considering entities beyond their own group, beyond their own race or their own religion, their own sexual orientation, that it's the natural step that we, beyond, we go beyond our own species. And we think it doesn't matter whether you're white or black or whether you're gay or straight whether you're my religion or your religion or an American or some other nationality, that if you have an interest in avoiding suffering, then we'll stand up for your interest to avoid suffering. And I think that that is where we are heading, and it's much closer than many of us would presume it is today. Because as Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And that is exactly what we, say, what we find today. Over and over again, things that seemed impossible just a few short years earlier become inevitable. And I think that the case for animal protection, for environmental protection, for moving away from our meat-centered diet is so strong that nothing can hold it back. These type of systems like gestation crates and battery cages and veal crates, they didn't come about overnight. They didn't just materialize out of thin air. And they're not going to go away overnight either. But because of the tireless, dedicated animal advocates all across the country who I meet every week of my life. I'm so fortunate to get to meet so many great folks devoting their lives to helping give a voice to the voiceless. I'm confident that they are going to be relegated to the dustbin of agricultural history and that we are going to reach a truly humane society in which we can finally look at these animals in peace 
because we don't consider them just to be commodities for us to exploit anymore. So I thank you very much for coming out on this evening. I know you have a lot of things that you could be doing. I'm grateful to you all for coming out and joining us for Oakland Veg Week. I want to tell you that I'd be eager to hear from you. Here's all my contact info. You can email me. You can tweet at me. You can call me. I'll give you my business card. I'd love to hear from you. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Q&A. I'd love to hear any questions, any comments, any concerns, any criticisms. Whatever you want to talk about, let's talk about it. So thank you again. All right. Yes, sir. Or as a way, or as a way to practice kindness towards animals, or as a way to support human health, we're on really solid ground there. But if we try to make an argument that these things are going to, to reduce someone's carbon footprint, reduce the amount of energy input, and so forth, that, that, that we may be putting ourselves in a weak position. You know, there's been at least one analysis done so far showing that you know, if you eat soybeans. Great, much lower this carbon footprint than meat, but if you turn the soybeans into a, into a soy burger, it ends up being the same. Yeah, so I appreciate you bringing this up, and I, I, I have seen numerous studies showing that, of course, eating a soy burger is more carbon intensive than eating soybeans, but I've never seen a study suggesting it's the same as eating meat. That seems, um, that would seem implausible to me, but I would love to, well, I'd welcome seeing the evidence, because I would certainly be open-minded about it. Um, numerous studies that I've seen show that eating these products actually do reduce your carbon footprint. And yeah, it's better to eat foods in a whole form for a variety of reasons. But I agree with you that for many people who are accustomed to eating a diet of meat, eggs, and dairy every single day, these foods can be very helpful for them, for sure. All right, Virginia. What do you think about that show, uh, The Chew? I love it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They got a lot of meat on that show. What's, what's about the chew? I've... The chew. Oh, yeah, it's an hour long, and it's a. If I heard the chew, I think it was like a dog show with like <laughs> toys or something. What well, is it? One guy on it, you know, they have to be a macho, you know, one of the hosts, and he says he had, I don't know, a girlfriend or something. But uh, he's got to eat his meat. She's uh, a vegetarian, and that's yeah. the end of the romance. Uh, that's a shame. I've not heard of the show, but it sounds intriguing. I would. <laughs> boring as hell. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, go. Um, so the other day, I was on my Facebook, and uh, one of my friends posted something. I have heard of it. thing about, you know, compassionate and, you know, how to be kind to others. And everybody had all the people who would rather not hear it and ignore it than to, to even acknowledge it. I mean, I think they know it, yeah. but they just don't want to hear it. And yeah, it's a really great point. So, you know, messaging is everything for us, and it's really, it's a fine line to walk because, you know, what Paramount informs is that we'd be effective. Like, animals don't need us just to be right. They need us to be both right and effective. And so it can be, you know, we can get up on a high horse and, you know, proclaim all of the righteousness of our way of life, and they might not be effective in the way that we do it. That certainly, I think, is a correct, you know, a correct description of the way that I used to be many years ago, many, many, many years ago. Um, but I think that leading by example is a great um, is a great way to help people without you know, necessarily putting them off. And I think it's important to recognize that most people don't change based on one impression. That many times it can take many impressions before somebody actually starts changing. I liken it to um, to two things. One is like um, a paint job that they usually require several coats of paint before the job is done. And a lot of the times I find, especially with me and my own behavioral kind of like stone cutting. And I'm sure you guys are all expert stone cutters, and so you probably don't even need me to explain why I say that, but I'll go for just the one or two of you who aren't expert stone cutters. Um, you know, when you're cutting stone, right, you're hitting it, and you're hitting it, and you're hitting it, and it creates these micro fissures that aren't perceptible to the eye every single time you hit it. And then one time, finally, you hit it, and the stone breaks. And to the casual observer, it looks like that last hit is what broke it, right? But it was actually couldn't have happened without all of the prior hits that came before. And for our own behavioral change, I think that's often what happens, is that something happens like, oh, that's what caused me to change X, when it was all of these previous experiences that led up into X and made it possible. And so those are the type of positive experiences that we have. So I think by doing things like bringing great uh, vegan foods to your workplace and sharing it with people, or um, a 
friend of mine uh, does a uh, Meatless Monday quiz contest for his coworkers where um, whoever does like uh, gets the most Meatless Monday trivia right, he bakes them, uh, I think it was brownies, I think he did. So anyway, there's all types of positive ways I think can do it. Free food is a great one. Speaking of free things, I want to point out two things. One, some of you are fortunate enough to have on the bottom of your chair a little treat. And so before you get up, check the bottom of your chair and you can see the coupon that you might have. Everybody's checking out. Number two, uh, we're gonna go, uh, we'll get to the second cool thing in a moment. Um, we'll get to the second cool thing in a moment. Any more questions though? All right, yes sir. You may say have yes. uh, a strategy document for, I mean, my sense in listening to you was uh, that there is a strategy. <laughs> and some of it, I assume, is your, your personal view. But is there a, a strategy document for how to, to cause this shift to happen? And if so, how would we get it? Uh, um, well, yeah, my personal views basically are all of the Humane Society's strategies because I dictate it all. No, just kidding. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I think that this is a job that goes beyond the Humane Society, first of all. Like, the Humane Society can't control. I mean, it's a great organization. It's very effective, but it, it can't control all of that. And so I think that the increasing popularity of things like Meatless Monday and putting fuel on that fire help to drive it. I mean, a lot of these things are coming about not because of the work of any one group, but because of the prevailing norms in our society that are leading toward this that help become possible because of the work of many groups. So that said, what I think are the most effective things uh, as far as strategies are concerned are to promote meat reduction. I think people are far more likely to start doing meat reduction like Meatless Mondays and dip their toe in and then progress can be get progress perhaps for people. And to look, focus on institutional change. I think that we get a lot more bang for our buck by focusing on these institutional Meatless Monday policies than um, individual uh, consumer outreach. So I think those are, but I'm not against those other things. I think other ways of reaching out to individuals can be very good, very effective. My question was sort of somewhat technical. So I, I agree with all that. Yeah. Um, but but I'm, you know, I've supported the Humane Society for a long time. Good for you. What a wise man. And, but, but now there's no but. There's no but. Recently, yeah. have I become aware that the Humane Society was doing things other than helping dogs and cats? Yeah. And I think it's great. But, Good. but I think there are probably a lot of other people like me mm -hmm. who are really not aware of, of this and might want to better understand how we can influence yeah. humane society's position, mm. strategy. So I understand you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're a great spokesperson for them. Thank you. Uh, but but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of left with this feeling, well, like there's, you know, who's making decisions about how to message? Sure. Which things to focus on? Well, you'll be happy to know that every issue of our member magazine has a vegan recipe and feature on vegan cooking on it, every, every single issue. Um, you'll also be happy to know that we have a Meatless Monday recipe that goes out, a vegan recipe, every single week that goes out to nearly 100,000 members of ours who subscribe for it for free, and they get that by email or text or both. And we're also um, messaging on it in a variety of other ways, like you saw some of the TV coverage of it and all that. So. The Humane Society is a vast enterprise. Admittedly, most of what it does has nothing to do with agricultural issues at all. Um, so there's a lot of great priorities for many animal protection things that it's doing. And so needless to say, when you're doing so many things, you may not, not everybody's going to hear everything. But I would encourage you to read the magazine and to sign up for our recipes and to forward them around and get your friends to do it too. But I appreciate it. I, I think you, and I think you should contact the Immune Society too, by the way. Yes, sir. Yeah. Are you going to yes. spread this meatless movement to like uh, Asia or internationally because yeah great question like in, uh, 20 years ago I never heard of you know okay we won't eat meat we won't eat eggs uh, cheese whatever yeah from Chinese people but now I thought in a, few, a few months ago uh, what's the protein meat, yeah milk yeah and uh, I think huge consumption is growing over there it is. Um, it's, it's the fastest growing market for the meat industry in the world, China. Um, in fact, the Chinese have skyrocketed in their meat consumption so much that they now eat more meat than Americans do. Not per capita. They're still eating only about half of the meat that Americans do on a per person basis. 
But as a total, because there are over a billion Chinese people, like I think it's like 1.3 billion now, I think, um, compared to about 316 million Americans, Chinese people are eating more meat than Americans are. And that hasn't been historically the way it's been in China. Chinese people have enjoyed a largely plant-based diet, not a vegetarian diet, but a largely plant-based diet for centuries. And with the increasing uh, meat consumption there, we're seeing increasing obesity and heart disease and the other things that you would expect to happen. In fact, if you've never read the China study by T. Colin Campbell, it's a great book looking at uh, Chinese diets historically and the way that things are changing now in China. But the short answer to your question is yes, but it's still nascent. We, are, we have um, uh, Humane Society International, which does work in China and is promoting these type of farm animal programs, but it's very nascent, it's incipient. Um, what else can I say, it's embryonic. I mean, I don't know how many more things I would use, but the point is, um, it's not enough. We need more. And, um, you know, it's, I mean, honestly, it needs to be led by native Chinese people. You know, it's not gonna be effective for Americans to come in and say, hey, you know, don't go down this road, we were down it, it's gonna be more effective for Chinese people. And we need, you know, there, there are many um, folks in China, like for example, Peter Lee, who works for Humane Society International, promoting this message, but a lot more needs to be done. It's a it's an area of grave concern. Yes. PCRM has a vegan kickstart in Chinese in China. Cool. It is all in Mandarin, and it's nice. Doing, yeah, and it's doing pretty well. Nice. For those of you who aren't familiar, PCRM is the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. It's a nonprofit physicians group based in Washington D.C. And as you just heard, they have their vegan starter kick uh, starter kick their Kickstarter um, in um, in Mandarin. That's great. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm curious about the purpose of tail docking that was brought up earlier. Mm. I just I've, I know why the other things, the veal crates, the right. station crates. I see the purpose of that, but what's the point of the tail dock? Great question. Um, some dairy producers cut their cows' tails off because they believe that it will make the udder more cleanly, that manure won't get caught in the tail and then it won't go in the udder. Interestingly, not only is there no scientific evidence to uh, substanti substantiate the claim, but the American Veterinary Medical Association opposes the practice. And even just in the, within the last year, the National Milk Producers Federation, the trade group for the dairy industry, opposes the practice. They came out saying, we oppose the practice. There's no evidence that it does anything for utter hygiene or cleanliness. And yet milk producers still continue to cut their cow's tails off, which is a real problem because not only does it obviously hurt to cut your tail off without any pain relief, but a cow's tail is used not just for communication, which is a primary purpose of it, but also for fly defense. Cows use their tail to get flies off of them. And on these factory farms where you have high quantities of manure and warm weather often, that's primary, you know, huge uh, cause of flies. So it's a real animal welfare problem, not just at the time of the mutilation, but also for the rest of the animal's life where they're more vulnerable to flies. So it's a real problem. Uh, we did ban it here in California, which is the largest dairy state in the country, which um, is now illegal. We've also passed laws banning it in New Jersey, um, Rhode Island, Ohio, and soon we'll, we're gonna add Kentucky to that list as well. But lots of dairy producers still do it around the country. In fact, they killed a bill in Colorado this year, another big dairy production state. They killed a bill to ban tail docking in Colorado. Amazing. Um, Keiko, okay, we're going to come back to you after my friend in the back gets a chance. Um, I was just going to say, what um, are like, the maybe top one or two documentaries that you would recommend? Mm. Um, well, I would I wouldn't recommend seeing it tonight since word on the street is that their AV equipment isn't working, but Forks Over Knives is a great one that they were showing tonight at Whole Foods in Oakland, but unfortunately that didn't work out. And you guys came to the way better Oakland Veg Week event tonight anyway. Um, but I think that's a great documentary. Um, so I would uh, highly encourage seeing Forks Over Knives. Um, uh, you know, as far as the second one, anybody else have a second suggestion? Vegucated is a very good one. I like Vegucated. What was that? Eating, yeah, that's a good one. What was the other one? Food matters. Food matters. I haven't seen that one. But, all right, cool. Hungry for change. Hungry for change. I haven't seen that one either. Um, all right. Well, those are some other ones. All right. All right. Cool. Going old school on us, Jeffrey. That's all right. All right. Um, so, the next thing we're going to do is a little trivia. And for any vegans in the room, that's awesome. But you're not included in this, okay? <laughs> So if you're not vegan, 
I would like for you, the, one, the person who is going to answer this question first correctly is going to get your own free copy of Vegan Unplugged, a great cookbook and, um, and pantry organizer for vegan foods. So for all of our friends who are pre-vegan in the audience, you can say, what, what percentage did meat consumption decline from 2007 to 2012? Anybody remember? Nobody wants to admit they're not vegan. So yeah. Morgan. Is it by 5 billion or half a billion? Half a billion animals, yeah. What percentage? Well, yeah, what percentage of per capita consumption? How much less meat are we eating? 4.2%. Sorry, Morgan. <laughs> you know. I was, used to be a high school teacher, man. You're not answering this, their question, all right? <laughs> um, all right, thanks. I just had a question. How close are you guys getting Alameda County to do the Meatless Monday for our schools? Because we seem like we have so much progressive uh, cities here. I agree. You do have a lot of progressive cities here. Um, Oakland Unified School District is doing Meatless Monday already at the K through 8 level. And does Berkeley do it? Berkeley's not. Surprisingly. Wow. Yeah, we reach out to them. Um, Pleasanton is also in Alameda County. Um, and we're working with a number of other districts that we have students, um, children in the area. And we'd like to work with them to talk to these kids. It's more important for you to talk to Christy than to talk to me. Anybody else? Virginia. Someone, um, another question, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, you should, this is Q&A, anyway, sorry. That, uh, there's been uh, a lot of ads, the same ad again and again and again from Foster Farms. Yeah, right. Advertising that they are certified humane by American Humane Association. Right. And I wonder what, what, have, what has Foster Farms done differently that qualifies them? Yeah. What do you think about these other certification programs? There's a dizzying array of certification programs for third-party auditing of animal products. So dizzying that most people could never remember them all. Even, I mean, even people who devote their lives to this often don't know the difference between them. To make it easy, at humanesociety.org slash labels, we describe what each one of them means and doesn't mean. Again, humanesociety.org slash labels. That one in particular, your suspicion of Virginia is correct. It's really not that different from standard industry practices. They really didn't have to change that much. The standards are... Um, largely, not entirely, but largely codifying standard industry practice, unfortunately. All right, no other questions? Well, first and foremost, I want to thank you again. Second, I want you to make sure that you take whatever food is left, put it in your bag. If you want to eat it now, we want you to eat it. That would be awesome. Third, I'm telling you, we are going to change the world. I meet so many awesome animal advocates around the country. I can't tell you how inspiring it is for me to be able to work with so many fantastic, selfless people who want to create a more humane society. It is the joy and honor of my life to be able to do it. So I'm grateful to be here with each and every one of you. I'll be around here. If you want to get my business card, I'd love to give it to you. I'd love to chat more. Finally, please give a huge round of applause to Christy and everyone else organizing Oakland Veg Week.